On behalf of Celosco, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our 13th webinar about asset integrity. My name is Marcel Svinia, and I'm a co-founder of Celosco, hosting this webinar. Because how to achieve an efficient RCM implementations. We will be, be discussing strategies to optimize resource allocation. And let me start by introducing our guest expert Harry van Teilingen to talk about these strategies. Harry is a distinguished expert in reliability center maintenance, a wealth of experience in inspection and maintenance spending many years. Harry honed his skills and expertise during his extensive tenure at, at Shell, where he made significant contributions to the field. And in his role as a C expert in reliability center maintenance in Moscow, he continues to leverage his in-depth knowledge and practical insights to enhance maintenance strategies and optimize operation reliability. So before we start, let me just outline the framework of the webinar. We will start with introducing uh, what RCM is about and some of its benefits. And when we have a better understanding of this, Harry will discuss some of the strategies for implementing RCM. At the end, there will be time to answer questions, and we have already received a few up front, but please feel free to put any of these questions that you may have in the chat. And also, please note that for any reason you experience a bad connection on your site, a refresh of your browser will bring you back into the webinar. So let's get started. Hi, Harry. How are you today? Very good, uh, Marcel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> to see you again. I think we had you on the show before. Um, so Harry, we've promised to talk about RCM implementations today and specifically some strategies to optimize resource allocation. But before we get into some of those strategies, can you introduce RCM to us and how an organization can benefit from implementing it? Um, yes, of course, uh, Marcel. Um, at its core, RCM is a systematic methodology that aims to ensure the reliability and availability of crit critical assets and um, as such minimizing also the maintenance cost. Um, these aspects are typically industry machines and equipment. And um, for a company, based on the gap to your potential, um, you can focus your RCM on the performance losses caused by equipment failures. Note that um, not uh, all performance loss may be caused by equipment failures. Um, you can also have losses caused by, say, poor commissioning, partial repairs, or operational mistakes. Um, these aspects may be picked up by RCM, but RCM will not provide, say, maintenance tasks for this, but maybe do more general, uh, generic recommendations. Um, RCM was uh, developed in the aerospace and aviation industry last century. Um, and it was actually to deal with the growing complexity of the airplane machines. Um, RCM has since found its uh, application also in the industry, focusing, focusing on identifying the most effective maintenance strategies for assets and considering their criticality and the consequence of the failures. As such, RCM involves a structural approach with the guidance of the seven questions of RCM. Um, and yeah, I like to mentioned that um, you can use international standards for RCM also, like for instance, the EACA 6300, which gives you also a comprehensive description of the RCM process. Okay, so, so, so can you take us through the main aspects of this structured RCM approach? Okay, the, the main aspects um, are, uh, for instance, first say to identify your critical assets. Um, and uh, these are then critical for the organization's, oper organization's operations. Um, these assets are typically those that um, if there's a failure, there's a significant impact on safety, productivity, or cost. Um, and as RCM is a risk-based approach, it's important to focus on the higher risks uh, that you have in your business um, and um, uh, to avoid that you put efforts on the lower risk. As we will talk later also on resource optimization, you know, we often see that people start to put a lot of effort in the lower risks, um, but it's important that you focus on the higher risks and prioritizing the assets um, on these higher risks can help you to steer towards these higher risks and um, reduce your efforts. 
The next step that's important is actually the understanding of the failure modes of your equipment. Um, and here um, uh, we focus, of course, on the critical assets. And this includes an understanding of how and why failures occur um, and what their consequences and the likelihood is. Um, to identify failure modes of an equipment, to recommend to study, um, for instance, first the layout of that equipment, st starting with basic picture, then um, look at a cross-sectional drawing to understand how the equipment is actually built up. Um, and the next, do a check of its position in the production process. This can be done on a PNID or a schematic drawing. Um, insight in the position of the equipment in the production process gives you an idea, okay, what are the effects if the equipment fails? What are the streams that go through that uh, piece of equipment? Um, and um, are there any instruments around it where you can pick up um, uh, equipment failures? Um, and finally, to get an insight of the failure modes, you may want to check your maintenance history and the maintenance manual. Um, and in the maintenance manual, it's important to look at what recommended spare parts there are provided um, uh, by the original equipment manufacturer, because the original original equipment manufacturer has typically an, an insight of which parts are most used, and these parts can relate to the failure modes of that equipment. Um, if you analyze your failure modes um, and the effect of them, um, you actually do a failure mode and effect analysis or FMEA. Um, and um, uh, as, as such, I also like to mention that also for FMEA, there's an industrial standard, the EX6812, um, which can be used if you're uh, interested in how to set it up. Um, the effects of the failure modes are uh, assessed in what we call a no maintenance scenario to give an indication uh, of what happens when this failure occurs. And um, this is actually the, the basis of the maintenance strategy uh, and the PM tasks. Um, from the uh, selection of the um, maintenance strategies, um, we see that an important aspect of the risk-based approach is that if there's a high risk, you can do more maintenance. Um, if there's a low risk, you can do less maintenance. And if there's a no risk, you actually do no maintenance. This is actually an indication that um, if you look at the no maintenance strategy of a failure mode, that actually the risk that you identify is an indicator of the um, maintenance budget that you have to um, uh, avoid that, that degradation or the consequences. Um, so the fact of that um, is that yeah, if you underestimate your risk, what sometimes is done by specialists, you know, you might say, okay, um, there are no of minimum consequences here, and that then you actually remove your um, uh, available maintenance budget to to mitigate those failure modes. We found out. If you look at a rule of thumb and you estimate your risk in dollars per year, that you can spend about one third of your risk in dollars per year in maintenance, also in dollars per year. Yeah. And this is a good indication, you know, that your risk is an, 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 a measure for your maintenance budget. Um, next, based on the analysis of the failure modes, um, RCM um, helps the organization to choose the most suitable maintenance strategy. Um, this is driven by the characteristics of the failure mode, for instance, if it's age-related or non-age-related degradations, or um, if these um, uh, consequences are made themselves known, or if they are hidden. Um, a part of the maintenance strategy selection is a verification of its effect. Um, Basically, one needs to estimate, you know, given the, the degradation and the maintenance strategy provided, yeah, what will be the effect of that um, failure mode um, uh, and would that failure mode actually occur after all, uh, once again. Um, and this aspect gives an estimate of what we call the residual risk. Um, People might think if you do a certain task, that these tasks will be executed perfectly. Um, but if you look at your uh, history and how preventive maintenance tasks are executed, you may realize that the tasks are not always executed as perfectly as you expected. Um, in the end, you know, um, a proper maintenance strategy 
um, can then be assessed by two main criteria. The first criteria, okay, is the risk reduction um, uh, big enough? So is the residual risk low enough? So that you can say, hey, this risk is, say, um, properly mitigated. And secondly, if you look at the risk reduction um, based on, say, dollars uh, per year, what does then, say, the maintenance cost? And can we look at the ratio of what the risk reduction is versus what the uh, maintenance task cost per year? Um, and um, uh, we use this indicator uh, and we call it the main sufficient index um, to actually give an, an, an impression of the maintenance strategy that is provided is economically um, beneficial compared to the risk reduction. Of course, you can say that it's beneficial if this ratio is bigger than one, um, but we have learned that if you have a good understanding of the degradation and if your maintenance tasks are powerful, that then this MEI uh, should be bigger than two, um, which basically means that all the analysis with an MEI between one and two, uh, you might want to verify them if you can do that better. Um, finally, our SIM guides to development of maintenance plan and schedules um, with tasks tailored to the critical equipment. Um, and um, although it seems simple, we have found out that yeah, we, you, you need to apply reliability support to the maintenance departments in the creation of efficient preventive maintenance plans um, and to make a proper combination of tasks which uh, help you to minimize waste while you execute these tasks. Um, and um, insight in the constraints of these tasks um, can help um, um, to um, uh, get the efficient execution of the task and um, uh, to optimize the work packages uh, that can be executed in an efficient way. Um, so as such, we see that where in RCM, the focus is on say justification of the maintenance, reducing the risk. When you hand over the task um, to the maintenance planner for execution, you should give assistance to combine them into efficient work packets. So, so I think it's safe to say that RCM is a, a powerful methodology that, that delivers substantial value to organizations across various industries. Do, do you agree with this, Harry? Yes, I think so indeed. Yeah, um, its ability to uh, improve equipment uh, reliability, reduce maintenance costs, enhance safety, and uh, support strategic decision making underscores its imp importance. Yeah, in um, achieving operational excellence. Um, Organizations continue to face new challenges and opportunities, and RCM remains a cornerstone in effective asset management, ensuring that these critical assets perform uh, on their best, even in the most demanding uh, environments. Um, embracing RCM is not just a maintenance strategy, it's a pathway to a su sustainable success in the modern um, business landscape. Those sound like some significant benefits, but I think there's also a perception that, that RCM is a resource intensive methodology. What are some of the factors that contribute to this perception and, and are they real or imagined? Well, they can be real, <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, so um, some of the elements in this perception, perception um, come forward from, for instance, that uh, sometimes RCM studies are started with a poorly defined scope and uh, uh, not clear boundaries. Um, uh, and then um, the study starts with the main equipment, um, but uh, during the analysis, people uh, get enthusiastic and then they pick up uh, also the lower critical equipment and the RCM facilitator then sometimes find it hard uh, to, uh, to stop and um, to, uh, uh, to contain that. Um, so there's room for improvement um, on defining a detailed and agreed scope uh, upfront. Um, Secondly, um, yeah, we need a multidisciplinary team, you know, with representatives from uh, operation technology um, and the technical disciplines, um, maintenance. Um, and that is, of course, a big group in the room. Um, and each hour that you spend there, you know, you, you spend multiple um, uh, hours for the men uh, involved there. Um, and uh, one of the things that an RCM facilitator does wise is to be to make sure that you discuss uh, subjects in that team that are relevant for all those uh, people that are in that in that in that team. Um, so um, 
often we see that subjects are discussed where only one or two uh, participants are actually involved. And if you do that, then the other people ask you after one morning, oh, can I go because uh, I'm not part of this discussion. Yeah. Um, so there's then the room for improvement for a better preparation of those um, meetings. Um, and actually make sure if you need to engage with, say, um, uh, just one of these disciplines, then to do that in a preparation phase and take that offline from that meeting. Um, next, uh, when you do an RCM study, you want to do uh, quality checks. Um, uh, it's very easy during RCM work, you know, to oversee an, uh, an element um, and um, uh, you device to uh, pick that up as quick as possible. Um, definitely. Um, uh, on a time scale that the people who were in that RCM study still remember the um, uh, the data and still can buy in to that uh, result. Um, so I've learned to do uh, quality checks and uh, to come back uh, quickly to the group to say, hey, I think we forgot or something or there are some doubts that we can improve that in an efficient way. Um, so that may help also to make it more uh, effective. Um, another Item might be that, uh, yeah, from uh, RCM analysis done, the facilitator may decide to reuse some of the analysis um, and some of the scenarios. Um, because, yeah, if you get the input from uh, operations, then you have a bit of an idea how um, the degradation is then uh, occurring in the field. Um, and that might be, say, used for future analysis and uh, speed up the, uh, the RCM studies. Um, this can go to the next step where, for instance, uh, the team buys in maybe to more generic approaches for RCM um, called sometimes uh, templating um, and uh, where the decision could be made that for certain type of equipment, the equipment is so comparable that uh, one uh, maintenance strategy can be put in a template and can be copied in on those equipment in a um, uh, fast and uh, rapid way. Um, and finally, you know, um, for the handover of the task execution, as I mentioned before, close cooperation of the RCM facilitator with the planner will help to cre create these efficient um, uh, maintenance plans. Um, and one of the things we have seen uh, more than once is that uh, a study was done, people were all happy, and uh, the tasks were handed over to, uh, to maintenance. And two years later, people found out that the tasks were not yet in, uh, in SAP, for instance, uh, which is, of course, a bit disappointing of all the work done. Um, and you definitely will not get the result, uh, of course, um, um, if you do it that way. Um, finally, um, i like to mention that all these aspects uh, actually tie together and actually form a business process, a reliability or RCM uh, business process. Um, and I think it's it's good to follow the quality approach um, in working that business process where you want to um, uh, yeah, have the key elements of the plan, do, check, act uh, aspects um, applied to that RCM uh, process. Um, so to translate into to practical terms, you know, the, the plan to do an RCM study um, uh, you can argue that uh, you should write, say, an, uh, a scope document before you get started. And uh, I think the good thing of such a scope document is that you can already indicate there uh, what you expect, how many resources are needed. And uh, you do wise if you write a scope document for an RCM study to actually ask your management to sign that off. So they buy in then both for um, uh, the uh, the resources and the effort that's needed to do the study, as it also then uh, highlights to the people that you need that uh, um, management has approved this and you, uh, the participation is expected to uh, to pick that up. Um, of course, in the plan, do, check, act approach, uh, after you did your study, you can write an end report where you highlight what were the the, uh, the main uh, results from the study, um, how much value is there in the study, but also then actually how much resources were used. Um, and that will help you um, if you want to steer towards a more, um, uh, say, effective RCM study um, and uh, reduce your resources that are needed. Very interesting, Harry. The 
an organization looking into to implementing RCM from scratch. What are some of the resources needed to get started with an effective implementation? Um, yeah, good question. I think uh, resources can, of course, be uh, people, but also uh, money, budget, uh, and a more structured approach. And I think one of the um, initial steps is that um, uh, yeah, you 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 need to identify your uh, critical assets, the the failure modes, developing major strategies, and that will be your first um, effort that you need to do. Um, uh, uh, this process can be time consuming the first time that you do that. Um, so it may uh, require upfront investment um, uh, because you do it the first time and you need to get acquainted to it, um, including, of course, um, yeah, the people you need, the training and maybe tools that you need to do this. Um, Another element of this is that uh, you need to um, uh, yeah, acquire data and analyze the data. Um, so uh, for efficient implementation, um, uh, you need to have access to uh, accurate and comprehensive data on the assets and the historic performance. Um, so collecting, validating, and analyzing this data can be resource intense, um, particularly if um, this data is not uh, um, uh, systematically collected and maintained uh, in the past. So then you may find yourself that you need to um, validate the data um, and make sure it's accurate enough for your RCM uh, analysis. Another aspect may be expertise and training. Um, so uh, you need, of course, certain level of expertise in reliability engineering and uh, maintenance management. Um, and as such, uh, an RCM facilitator is a person that needs to be a connector between multiple disciplines and be able to get that information out of these um, uh, disciplines. Um, so. Um, you need to invest in training your uh, personnel um, uh, and uh, maybe even hire some experts who can help you to facilitate the RCM process and get it initially uh, started. Um, so that can then involve both costs for training um, and um, uh, the, the, the time needed to uh, get the, the knowledge and the skills uh, picked up. Um, Another aspect that you might want to consider is the question, yeah, okay, how complex are your resources, uh, your assets? Um, so um, if you have more complex assets with um, uh, higher risks, uh, bigger protection systems, um, uh, higher pressures, uh, higher temperatures, um, that uh, gives some complexity that um, um, uh, yeah, makes it more time consuming to do the to do these analysis. Um, so highly complex systems uh, with say interconnected components may require more uh, in-depth analysis and consequently consequently more resources of course um, and um, uh, typically we see this uh, happening when you have uh, expenses or hazardous products uh, in your um, facility. So I'm, I'm not sure all organizations are able or even willing to allocate all of the resources you just mentioned um, across their entire operation from the ground up. So can you get started with RCM without implementing it across the board all at once? Well, I think uh, you can, and uh, I think that's a good idea, you know, so uh, you might uh, scale it and scope it uh, up front. Um, so uh, the size and uh, the scope of an uh, RCM initiative um, is um, uh, affecting the, the resource requirements very much. Yeah. Um, so you may uh, start to focus on your critical, crit critical assets um, and uh, start off uh, small, you know, um, with implementing uh, RCM there. Um, because yeah, implementing across the board demands too much manpower and time. Um, um, and a, strategic, a strategic approach to reduce the RCM scope and focus on the assets uh, is then critical. Um, and typically, the things you want to focus on, okay, what were say the the incidents that uh, occurred in the in the plant? Um, where did we have uh, pr production loss? Um, where do we see high uh, maintenance costs? Um, and um, uh, uh, how would that then balance, you know, with the potential um, uh, resources that we need to 
um, uh, reserve for this and uh, how would it then uh, balance out with the benefits. Um, yeah, with focusing on the critical equipment and actually the, the higher MAI strategies, um, uh, uh, the uh, task can be then put into execution um, and uh, while uh, being executed, you know, people might learn uh, more and more from the equipment. Um, as I said, you know, in RCM, um, we analyze the equipment based on failure modes. Um, but in the field, you know, uh, we may realize that our uh, expected degradations um, and the causes for the degradations might be a little bit different as what we expected. So we can fine tune that um, uh, along the process. Um, so uh, a phased approach with a small start minimizes the resource loads while it enables the learning of the methodology and the process and um, um, uh, yeah, get it then actually uh, established in the field. Yeah, makes sense. Are there any organizational changes that would need to be made to ensure that an RCM implementation continues to be effective over the long term? Um, yes, I think so. Um, of course, uh, you need a reliability department and uh, uh, RCM facilitators. Um, but uh, yeah, to get started, I think it's important to um, have some knowledge about uh, change management. Um, so in implementing RCM often involves a shift of the organizational culture um, and the, the current processes that are in place um, and managing that uh, change and getting buy-in from the stakeholders and ensuring that uh, RCM uh, practices are say effectively integrated into existing maintenance routines. Um, yeah, that can be uh, resource intense. And uh, yeah, I, I think that we need to be well planned in an Im implementation plan. Um, as such, it's important um, to highlight the urgency to do RCM. Uh, is there a sense of urgency for this? Um, and uh, from there, actually provide guidance um, for the RCM studies that um, people feel that they are supported um, uh, in uh, preparing and executing the RCM studies. Um, it would be good to have a clear uh, vision towards reliability. Um, and uh, how RCM fits in that, um, and that vision should be shared, you know, from from management to the stakeholders involved. Um, and if there are any obstacles, um, these should be removed, you know, to make clear that the vision um, is the way to go uh, in the company. Um, of course, after an RCM study is done, you know, you do wise to uh, share the results and uh, to celebrate uh, successes. Um, uh, uh, and uh, 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 one of the other aspects is that you do wise to include your RCM process in your formal quality system. So it, it is clear that uh, RCM is now part of your business process as a whole. Another aspect is the, the continuous monitoring and feedback. Um, so after implementing an initial RCM study, organizations need to continue to monitor and refine the maintenance strategies based on uh, feedback and performance data. Um, as I said before, um, yeah, we, we, we analyze equipment based on failure modes and uh, the anticipated uh, degradations um, uh, of those failure modes. Um, but it, we, we, we might learn later that these degradations may be a little bit different as what we anticipated uh, in the beginning. Um, so an ongoing process um, uh, can require, of course, ongoing resources uh, for data collection, analysis, uh, and adjustment of these uh, maintenance plans. Um, we call this uh, in RCM, uh, the living program. Um, and um, uh, yeah, it is, it is important that uh, meetings um, uh, that involve this living program activity um, are held, people are uh, joining there um, and that uh, this review of these maintenance strategies are done continuously. Um, also here, a link to the quality system can help um, to do at least a formal yearly review of the RCM work done. Um, for instance, okay, 
how many meetings were there, um, how many corrections were, for, were, were applied, um, and get a bit of an indicator of the of the volume and the quality of the uh, uh, of the changes made. Um, also, um, the need to be focused on uh, anything that uh, that was learned in the process. Um, and of course, you can uh, get an insight, okay, how much resources were used and what are the results gained? And that can help you if you're afraid that you overspend on resources that uh, that might actually occur. Um, another element might be uh, technical, te te technical, uh, technology uh, investments, sorry, <laughs> um, which, um, Nowadays, come up, of course, uh, more and more and quicker and quicker um, uh, with the Internet of Things. Um, it's more easy to get um, uh, sensors in the field, um, to get more data in, um, uh, to get more information, to get better measuring instruments to do condition monitoring. Um, and yeah, to uh, fully leverage RCM, um, the organization may need to invest in these uh, technologies um uh and uh, uh yeah get uh, say software in place to um uh, analyze the the um the preventive and predictive maintenance and uh to read out sensors uh, in the fields um and uh, yeah while these uh, technologies can um, lead to long long term cost savings of course to get them in place um you need to do first investment um and get started um, before we move to, to the conclusion and to the questions of our audience, um, we've come across uh, quite a few frequently asked questions and it might be nice to, to, to bring them up. Um, one that I've seen before is what RCM uh, can be done on electrical components? Yeah, electrical components um, uh, are uh, uh, typically, of course, uh, circuit boards. Um, um, yeah, if, if you look at RCM first, we're interested in the build-up of the equipment. Um, and one of the questions is, of course, uh, are there, uh, say, maintainable and uh, exchangeable parts um, on the equipment? Um, so, uh, especially in case of uh, circuit boards, um, <clears throat> these can be very complex. And at the same time, um, they may, may not hold uh, maintainable parts uh, at all. Um, so the complexity of these boards is that sometimes there are multiple layer boards with a lot of connections, very small um, uh, conductors, um, so it's quite hard to repair them. Um, of course, um, uh, from the equipment manufacturer, you know, uh, it's of interest to look at uh, the spare part list and if this uh, supplier has any spare parts that um, you may uh, uh, use, you know, for repairs. Um, but uh, in many cases, we see that uh, the alternative is to place, uh, replace a circuit board uh, altogether. Um, and uh, then uh, you come to a conclusion that the board on itself is not a maintainable item. Um, and um, uh, yeah, the question is if there are companies uh, anyhow who uh, are willing to um, uh, repair that or restore them. Okay, but electrical components often show random failures. How do you deal with that? Well, good, good, good point. Um, yeah, here uh, it's relevant if we can describe the degradation of these um, uh, of these electrical components, um, and if we can uh, say influence that uh, degradation. Um, and we already saw, for instance, on the electric uh, circuit boards that they may uh, fail instantly. Um, and the only thing you can then do is uh, to um, uh, exchange them. Yeah. Um, but on the other side, we often see that on electrical uh, circuit boards uh, that the failure is uh, accelerated if the temperatures are higher uh, or there's fouling, you know, um, with dust um, and humidity. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, there, there are situations known where um, yeah, if, if, if it gets warmer in the, in the room that, um, uh, and, and the, the filters of the vent ventilation systems get uh, fouled, um, that the ventilation flows uh, reduce, um, and that then um, the people as an alternative just put open the cabinets um, and then uh, it may uh, uh, pick up all dust and um, humidity and that might cause an whole extra set of um, uh, uh, errors on the on the equipment. Um, 
So yeah, to keep electronics cool and clean, that will help. Um, and of course, this can be done with, uh, say, uh, the local air conditioning of the area um, and uh, the cooling system is actually working um, and that the substations where this is installed are actually cleaned um, uh, and uh, well maintained. Um, another one of those frequently asked questions that we've seen is, is how does RCM deal with equipment nearing end of life? Yeah, end of life uh, is a typical situation where we see that uh, the product law on the product life cycle, the demand for the product and the demand for the spare parts um, is dro dropping off. Um, and then the supplier of that equipment is no longer interested, you know, to um, uh, yeah, make, make services and spare parts uh, available. Um, and of course, the unavailability of uh, spare parts um, uh, and uh, the manufacturer servers may come to a total uh, stop, you know, um, uh, and um, that may ask for a replacement uh, of the equipment. Um, this may be identified by RCM. Um, but typically we see that um, uh, deciding that it, the equipment actually need to be replaced uh, is typically an investment proposal that's needed. Um, and uh, then uh, you might want to re re replace these obsolete models with uh, so more common models, which are typically um, better, cheaper uh, and more powerful. Yeah. I have a few more of these frequently asked questions, Harry, but uh, I think uh, we also need to leave some time for our users to ask questions. So I think it's time uh, to wrap up this bit. Can, can you summarize the benefits of having a well thought out RCM strategy? Yeah, I think uh, it's important to note that uh, while impl implementing RCM may appear resource in, in uh, intensive upfront, you know, the goal is to optimize the maintenance efforts over the longer term. Um, and uh, the resources invested in RCM are uh, intended to reduce maintenance costs, increase equipment reliability, um, and extend uh, the, 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 the asset lifespan and improve uh, the safety. Yeah, um, um, the benefits often outweigh these initial costs um, and uh, will lead to an improved overall efficiency and effectiveness um, in the asset management. Um, Use can be made of the uh, plan do check act quality approach, you know, um, where the quality as aspects can be, uh, for instance, the resources that you need. Yeah, so uh, then uh, you make it an explicit element in your uh, assessment of your uh, success, actually. Um, and uh, we typically recommend to write an RCM end report after a study to uh, identify, you know, if the actual resources that were used um, uh, are in balance with the uh, equipment analyzed, you know, and uh, this can help you to steer next RCM studies towards a better balance of these resources and, and result, uh, results of the RCM study. Um, there you also see the connect between having a plan up front and the end report in the end, where you expect that based on the end report that the next um, uh, plan for the next RCM study is better and more effective. Uh, um, so um, actually, I think to, to mitigate the perception of a high resources cost, um, organization can take the phased approach um, to RCM implementation, actually prioritize your assets based on criticality um, and leverage uh, the technology and the expertise to streamline the process um, and uh, yeah, use, use your quality system to guide it. Um, but definitely a sort of planning, clear communication and uh, a commitment to the uh, longer term benefits of RCM can help uh, to ensure, ensure a successful and cost effective implementation. Um, any last words or thoughts you'd like to add, Harry, before we move over to the questions? Well, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to share some uh, other uh, side effects that we see from RCM um, during the, the RCM studies. Um, typically, what we see is that the operations get a better understanding of the sensitivity of the equipment um, and what they should do and should, should not do um, with the equipment. Um, we see typically that uh, maintenance get a better understanding why e equipment gets degraded uh, and then why it may break down. Um, so also there uh, people learn. Um, discipline engineers get a better opportunity to keep their equipment in good shape. Um, 
And uh, I think altogether uh, an important aspect is the improved uh, mutual understanding of the um, uh, uh, equipment over the various disciplines leading to better cooperation um, and a higher reliability. Oh, thank you, yes, Harry. Um, uh, we, we got an overwhelming number of questions, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure that we cannot answer all of them today. Um, but um, uh, be assured that that we will address them individually after the webinar, so you will get an answer uh, on your questions. Um, let, let me kick off the first one, Harry. Harry, um, do you have a prioritization metrics for implementing RCM across plant equipment? Uh, yes, we have. Um, uh, it's uh, particularly of interest to focus the RCM efforts to the higher critical uh, equipment. Um, so uh, I think it's a very good question and uh, it's a very important uh, step. Um, maybe some of you know that uh, RCM has seven questions and on question five, the question is, uh, does the failure matter? <laughs> Um, which um, uh, at which it may become clear, you know, that uh, the failure uh, does not matter, <laughs> but you already um, have put in quite some effort to uh, answer all these questions, you know. Um, so prioritizing uh, equipment um, can help uh, to focus on um, with the equipment that you want to do a detailed uh, RCM uh, analysis on. Um, the problem is that prioritization is typically that you need to have some um, RCM knowledge and experience um, uh, and insight in equipment failure modes and effects, you know, to to, to run that process. Um, but um, um, yeah, we, we, we see situations where people first prioritize uh, actually all the equipment that they are interested in uh, and from there actually um, put it in two buckets, one bucket where they want to do a detailed RCM analysis and another bucket that, um, yeah, if there's uh, any time left that they might apply um, same um, uh, templates uh, to those equipment. Um, another question that I have here is, are there any RCM strategies that can help in dealing with random failures? Yeah. Um, this is, of course, uh, random failures are, of course, uh, very dependent on uh, the failure modes and the degradations uh, involved. Um, but uh, yeah, I must say that um, uh, most of the failure modes are uh, non-age related. Uh, and sometimes you say non-age related is random. Um, and uh, the common RCM strategies for such uh, situations is uh, condition-based maintenance and uh, condition monitoring. Um, so. Um, uh, the basis for this is to identify uh, a uh, performance decay, um, which can be uh, determined, you know, which can be measured. And that uh, point um, where this is then measured is called uh, a point of potential failure. Um, and um, if you operate your equipment further, then you uh, may end up in a failed state. Um, and uh, um, uh, this can be then visualized, this degradation in what we call a PF curve. That's a curve between the potential failure and the failure point. Um, and um, typically, um, insight in that PF curve um, can help to um, say, hey, what condition monitoring uh, can be done? Um, <clears throat> what interval is needed. And typically we see <clears throat> that um, condition monitoring is done at half the PF interval uh, at least uh, or at uh, shorter intervals. <clears throat> uh, here's a question, Harry, that I just pick out on, of the chat now. Um, here somebody asks, can RCM be conducted on the construction stage of the plants to align the installation requirements and installation and test procedures? Yeah, it can. Um, actually, I think uh, it can be a good a good thing to do uh, an RCM study in the, um, say, the engineering phase of a project while the plant is not yet built. Um, and uh, I would definitely recommend to do that for the, yeah, the complex uh, equipment um, uh, in, the, in the plant. Um, I think the, the truth is that um, people who are engineering a plant and building a plant are often um, focused on uh, yeah, get, getting the right uh, equipment and the right specs of the equipment in place. Um, 
but they are not always um, alert on uh, if the equipment is actually um, active in the field, um, what kind of degradations may occur and uh, how to maintain that. Um, and I, uh, I can share with you that uh, I was once uh, in, an, um, uh, uh, in, a, in a company where they were uh, engineering a uh, big project. Um, and when I started to do the first RCM uh, steps, um, they were a bit skeptical <laughs> in the morning. Um, but after two hours, um, after they have heard all the RCM questions, they started to realize that they had no good idea of how the equipment would degrade and what to do with that, you know. Um, and uh, at the first uh, coffee break that was there, a lot of engineers uh, left uh, the room where we did RCM, um, started to write emails to the equipment manufacturers and ask them, okay, what is the time between failures of these uh, equipment and these parts? And they come up with all kinds of questions <laughs> to get clear. If the equipment they had in mind for that uh, plant were actually good enough. So yes, it can help. Another element where it can help, sorry, <laughs> is that um, it might also give you good insight on uh, your spare parts that you need. Yeah, um, uh, and uh, uh, it uh, to to do a proper RCM study, you need to have a knowledge and insight in the equipment, um, and that might then also give you an idea of the spare part consumption. I have a similar question. Uh, somebody's asking, uh, so, so not the construction stage, but for a brownfield that has been in operation for many years already with maintenance strategies in place, would it be appropriate to say RCM studies can only be justified for part of asset equipment where perhaps repeated failures are observed? Well, uh, also interesting question. Um, so uh, uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that um, uh, uh, we've seen sometimes that uh, uh, if sites are running more or less stable and they, let's assume they are already more or less okay with uh, the level of performance um, and then they are interested, hey, can RCM help, help us on how to do that? Um, one of the ways to do that is what we call um, in an approach called um, uh, backward RCM, um, which is actually an approach where you start off with the, the tasks that you do in the field. Um, from the task, you then wonder which failure modes uh, do we expect that are uh, mitigated by these tasks. Um, from those failure modes, you then want to know, okay, well, what kind of characteristics do these failure modes have? You know, are these age-related, non-age-related? Are they hidden or do they make it themselves known? Um, so, and then from those characteristics of the failure modes, do we then believe that these tasks are effective and uh, reduce the risk and are um, economically justified. Um, and more than once, uh, if you uh, yeah, do, do, do an assessment like that, you may come to the conclusion that sometimes t tasks are um, uh, prescribed that are not really effective. The timing is not always uh, 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 right. Um, and um, uh, uh, in the end, people um, may never have evaluated what came out of those uh, preventive maintenance tasks. Um, so they did not learn from uh, the execution of them. And the RCM can then help, you know, to actually justify that these tasks are good, sound, and economically justified. I think uh, we can squeeze in one more, Harry. Uh, I have one here in the chat that says, uh, when, when you evaluate the, the effectiveness of the selective maintenance strategy, what criteria do you use to determine if the unmitigated risk has been mitigated by the chosen strategy? Yeah, that's an that's a very good question. Yeah, um, actually, you look at uh, the effectiveness of your uh, RCM um, uh, program, um, and uh, I agree that uh, that might not be so easy to uh, to to establish that. Um, I I typically have a bit of a different uh, approach to that, and that is that um, I I like to um, uh, say export from your CMMS like SAP, before you do your RCM study, say uh, four years maintenance history. Um, and the idea is that if you analyze your equipment from that maintenance history, you get insight if there are repeat failures, high cost, etc. Um, and you input that in, in RCM. Um, 
that yeah, if you do a review four years later um, and you do a similar um, maintenance history export, um, that you then would expect that um, the activities that you did ha has, sh has shown a reduction in um, uh, breakdowns, a reduction in maintenance, um, and a reduction in costs um, of the equipment where you did your RCM study on. Yeah, um, so by periodically um, running an, uh, an export of the maintenance history, you might get an idea, you know, uh, did our PMs um, uh, reduce these uh, degradations and these failure modes? Um, and uh, did we um, uh, uh, yeah, get our uh, results here? You know, um, another part that might be of interest there, especially if people say, yeah, we already have PMs in place, is that, okay, if you have PMs in place and you still see corrective maintenance coming up, you know, how, how would you uh, justify that? Yeah. How do we, how can we say that even if we do preventive maintenance, we still get a lot of corrective maintenance and which corrective maintenance may then occur? And uh, is it an expected from the preventive maintenance and the failure modes we expect? Or did we overlook some failure modes and should we study equipment a bit deeper um, and uh, to, to, to a wider extent? Um, I have loads more questions. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, people in the audience, that we cannot answer them all. But again, we will get back to you uh, individually uh, with answers uh, after the call, after the webinar. Um, because our time has run out, um, I would like to uh, thank you, Harry, for this uh, yeah. informative discussion. I, I, on our I, see, I see one question here, if I, if I may. Okay, uh, I, need to, I need to wrap it up, Harry. So uh, I need to close it off. Um, oh, right. So for all your viewers watching, um, thank you for your time. We will get back to your questions one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Um, please take note that, that this webinar will soon be available uh, to download from our website. And then before we go, uh, I'd like to mention that we are already planning our next webinar uh, for December. The exact date will be communicated as soon as possible. Um, so we will be back with you. Thank you again for joining today and uh, hope to see you soon.